Hey what's up everybody, Trovinet here and welcome back to Gwent Edge. In this show we talk about specific Gwent cards or interesting decks to play around with. The Syndicate faction is a contentious one. On the one hand, we have a very unique faction with its own economy and keywords, but on the other hand it has a few overpowered plays and most of all a leader that has the ability to hold on to points and coins to use whenever he pleases without any way of countering it. You know who I'm talking about. But we're not here to talk about him, but about another one of the Syndicate leaders. Cyrus Hamelfort, the leader of the Firesworn Gang, a band of religious fanatics worshipping the Eternal Fire. Though his name may sound funny to native English speakers, it's actually a reference to his religious background. Himmelvaart in Dutch and Himmelvaart in German are the translations of the English word ascension, as in the ascension of Christ. So not so much a reference to the big man's gas problems, but more his religious background. Today we'll talk about a deck under his leadership, the Congregation deck. A few weeks ago we talked about Gimpy Gurwin and ways to counter swarm decks. Well today we'll be doing the opposite. The Congregation deck is a purebred swarm deck capable of quickly filling the field with fire sworn zealots. To complement the greedy aspect of creating swarms, we also have a few bounty units and damage dealers, so you can counteract what your opponent plays as well if needed. But more on that in a second. Let's take a look at Hamelfart's ability first. Cyrus Hamelfart can spawn a 2 power Firesworn Zealot on a row 3 times, and when all 3 charges are used, he generates 2 coins for a total of 8 points. Not super impressive on its own, but he complements the swarm playstyle perfectly. Vital to this deck are the two artifacts contained within. We've used Summoning Circle before, it gains a charge at the start of each turn and you can use it at any time to pull a unit from your deck with a provision cost equal or lower than its current charge count and play that unit on the field. It's great to set up a few of the combos this deck can pull off without worrying that one of your engines will be destroyed before your setup is complete. The other artifact we use here is the Sacred Flame. Playing this card spawns a Firesworn Zealot on either side of it and boosts each unit that spawns on your side of the field by one as long as it exists. This results in 6 points on the board, but also buffs Hamelfart's ability by boosting the zealots he spawns as well, upping his point potential to 11. This deck contains a bunch of ways to spawn units, but before we go over them we need to talk about one more engine that supports spawns. The Firesworn Scribe generates a coin whenever you spawn a unit on the field, as long as he's on the ranged row. If he's already on the field when you play Sacred Flame, he generates two coins, since those zealots are spawned separately. If both the Scribe and Sacred Flame are on the field, your leader can generate up to 14 points, since you now gain a coin for each spawn too. Not to mention that you can even have multiple Scribes on the field at the same time, but more on that later. To get the most out of these engines, we need to spawn units. We got you covered on that front as well. The Eternal Fire Disciple gives you 2 coins and can spawn a zealot on its row every turn if you spend 2 coins. The Kikimori Warrior can destroy an ally on Ori and spawn a base copy of itself. You can chain this every turn to basically have a spawn engine as long as the new copy isn't destroyed. Aside from being the name of this deck, Congregation is a crime card that allows you to spawn 2 zealots on a row. However, if you have no coins when you play it, Congregation spawns 3 zealots instead. They all get a boost from Sacred Flame, but the Scribes only generate one coin for all of them combined since they spawn in one go, but still, with Sacred Flame, this goes up to 9 points with one crime card. Last but not least, we have our heavyweights, rather literally with Grand Inquisitor Helveed. He gets you 4 coins when you play him and allows you to spawn a Zealot on his row for 2 coins. Sounds like a high-powered Disciple, but with the added benefit that Helveed does not have a cooldown, so you can use his ability as much as you can within the same turn. In combination with only a single scribe and no coins, this allows you to use this ability 3 times since you gain a coin every time you use it, for a total of 10 points in one go. If you have a few coins or multiple scribes, you can even fill your row immediately with an army of zealots. I would always keep one spot free however in case you want to play any more units on that row, but Helveed is your main zealot engine with a lot of potential. Our last gold spawner is Igor the Hook. Igor is frequently used in you know who decks, but I feel like he's more at home in this deck. Igor allows you to spend 5 coins, or 5 of his health, to create a copy of one of your bronze units on the field and spawn it on his row. Combine this with the scribes and you can quickly make a few copies to make your zealot spawns free or even give you coins. For some reason however, scribes trigger before your coins are spent, 
So for example, if you have three scribes and seven coins and use Helvete to spawn a zealot, you will stay at seven coins instead of the expected eight since you first gain three coins from the skies, but you only can keep nine and then spend two of them to spawn the zealot. I think this is a logic bug at the moment, but it's something to keep in mind. Igor can also be used to copy one of your passive Kikimor warriors to get that train going again if the active one is destroyed, or copy a disciple from the other row to fill his row with more zealots as well. I expect Igor to get a cooldown in the future since he's really strong at the moment, that would still make him viable in this deck. To complement the spawn mechanics we also have some coin engine cards to fuel our abilities. The Tax Collector generates a coin at the end of each turn when he's on the ranged row. Imke makes that 2 coins each turn, has more power and can get a shield if you spend 3 coins to protect her from any damage, making her really handy if she stays alive. Caesar Bilzen triggers the profitability of adjacent units when played and can boost a unit by 2 for 3 coins. His deployability can easily net you 4 coins or more and even works on enhanced profitabilities such as on the Borsodi products. The rest of this deck basically allows you to fight back. Witch Hunter, Slander and Caleb Mange can apply bounties, Witch Hunter Executioner and Graydon can take bounty units out for extra profit and the Borsodi brothers can boost or damage units by 2 for 2 coins each. We talked about these cards in the Spoils of Crime episode so I won't repeat the details here. Just keep in mind to take out units you applied bounties to quickly to avoid them being boosted or purified. As a nice finisher, this deck also contains a Bone Talisman. This special card boosts all your units on the field by 1, which can be up to 18 if the entire field is filled with units and consistently nets you at least 10 points in this deck. Playing this deck is all about getting the right setup. If you're going for a spawn round, the Sacred Flame or a Scribe is vital, but once they're set up, you can quickly generate a big swarm and lots of points. Summoning Circle can help in getting a scribe out at the same time you play Hellveed, for example, from your hand and riling up the masses. You can always mix in some bounties with Slander and the Executioners and use Horse Borsodi to buff your Zealots. The other way around works just as well. Bounties are great to both deal damage with the Executioners and generate coins. Graydon can be used to take out a big power unit in one go especially if you play a Witch Hunter with the Summoning Circle first, since it can't be countered. If you have the coin and you destroy a unit with a high base power, Graydon's Tribute ability is a must, since he'll boost himself by the base power of the unit he destroyed as well. Ewald and Menge can finish up any remaining threats, while still keeping your coin reserves high. If you still have a Disciple or Hellveed available, you can even finish up by spending your last coins on spawns and boost a lot with a Bone Talisman. If needed, you can also swap out the Bone Talisman in this deck for Kalkstein, since he's able to purify any bounties or locks away from your most important units. As you may have noticed, the game is in a peculiar state at the moment. Around 80% of the decks I have faced were either Dijkstra, Usurper or Ardal decks, the former being all-powerful and the latter two being the most popular counters to the former. This deck falls somewhere in the middle. Dijkstra is by far the most popular leader and this deck can often bite it where it hurts. The point carryover he gets, however, is very hard to overcome, as you can see in this match, where I barely got a draw after a 29 point lead. Dijkstra needs to be adjusted in some way, but that's another discussion. Against Usurper and Ardal, however, you stand a good chance with this deck. With Usurper, you can just play out the strategies I've described in this video and you'll win most of the time. They have a hard time countering this deck since you don't have any single big power units, but spread out your points so much. With Ardal, you should keep in mind that anything around 5 power can and will be seized. I often use a tax collector to lure him out, but Imke and the Borsodi brothers are the more risky targets here, so try to protect those. Pressing your point advantage against Ardal often causes them to seize prematurely in the first round, allowing you to win the later two and the match itself. Keeping Ewald Borsodi as your last card after spreading out some bounties is a great way to finish against Ardal since you can clean up in one round. This also works with Dijkstra decks if you can wait until he plays his Ewald. Just be careful not to overspend on your bounties or you'll risk them getting purified. And that's it for today, I hope you enjoyed this episode on the Congregation deck and Cyrus Hemelfart. Got any other ideas on how to improve this deck or awesome plays in Gwent? Don't hesitate to leave advice in the comment section down below so we can help each other out, because that's what we're here for after all. Any feedback is greatly appreciated. Check me out on Twitter at, at @trophynut. that's T-R-O-V-N-U-T, if you want to talk. And if you enjoyed this video, why not give it a like? Any support is really appreciated. Thanks enormously for watching and hope to see you guys in the next episode of Gwent Edge. 
Goodbye.